Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. If you're following with us, uh, we're in the book of Revelation. We've been hit and miss on some Sundays. We've had some special services. I've been gone a couple Sundays. And uh, yet the series is right here on YouTube for you to follow, uh, going through the book of Revelation. And we'll be back again with you next week. We're in uh, Revelation chapter 19 today. And as we've gone through the whole book of Revelation, just always want you to remember, it. the Lord's desire is for Him to be the focus, not only in this book, but in your life. He wants you to see Him. He wants you and I to see Him. He is the focal point of eternity as He fulfills the will of His Father, brings us home to be with His Father, to be with the Father, the Son throughout all eternity, the Spirit of God being there among us and in us. It's a beautiful picture. We have now completed chapter 18. We've seen the judgment of God upon the earth. Chapter 17 and 18, we, we see God just totally bring destruction to this world. Uh, completely tear down the foundations of the world. Everything that matters in this world, everything that's powerful, everything that has made the world what it is, God now destroys and tears down. And now the Lord is about to come. The second coming is, is on the verge of happening. But before that happens, we have a passage that we encounter. It's a beautiful passage. Uh, it's one of uh, uh, celebrations, one of anticipation. It's one of significance to you and I right now as we're living today in 2021. It impacts us right now. And so I want us to look at this. Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read it uh, with you this morning. So if you have your Bible, uh, go there with me. Revelation 19. And we begin in verse 6. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints and the angel said to me write this blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true words of god and then i fell down at his feet to worship him but he said to me you must not do that i'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of jesus worship god for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is, is overwhelmed with joy and, and, and amazement at what he is told here, what he has seen come to take place, and just his response is to fall down. He knows that Christ is the one that we worship, but he is overwhelmed. And the angel says, stand up, don't worship me. You're to worship Christ and Christ alone. That's And that's advice we need to always keep in mind we're never to give our worship our adoration to another but to christ alone but, but what fills his heart is the passage in just a few verses that are right here it's amazing uh, we have we have the marriage supper of the lamb uh, we have a feast we have a culmination we have a promise fulfilled we have we have joy in abundance here uh, it's joy that's going to be ours it's it's a moment in time that we are anticipating as the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. There's three elements that were uh, a part of a marriage ceremony in the Old Testament. And so those are very significant as we look at this picture today. So we're going to add those elements as we walk through this and, and use that to help us see the lens of what's going on. The first thing that we would have and we would understand and see when a marriage takes place is we would have a marriage commitment. That's, what, that's what's true here as well. God uses the picture of marriage in the scriptures and specifically here in the Old Testament as it's being now fulfilled and he's giving us a glimpse as to what he how he's fulfilled that uh, himself and we see this marriage commitment take place it's a divine it's a divine marriage it is marriage that has come it is it is about God God the Almighty we're exalting God it is his ceremony that's taking place and we're gonna see that as we walk through it's a divine relationship between between God and His church. Remember, the church has been absent uh, from from chapter um, four all the way through here in chapter into nineteen. Now we be, now we will see the church again as the tribulation comes to a close. Marriage is ordained by God. Genesis chapter two: Significant, a man shall leave his father and his mother 
and hold fast to his wife they shall become one flesh Adam would say well I don't have a mom I don't have a dad yet what's that but that shows the significance God God communicates this to Adam before he is even a father before he Eve is a mother God says this is of utmost importance I am giving to you a gift the ordinance of marriage is between a man and a woman a lot can be said about that it goes contrary to the sexual freedom of our culture that God's word holds fast for all of humanity in every culture this standard he applies across the board to every culture marriage is ordained by God it's a gift from God uh, we see in the Old Testament marriages were arranged often uh, yet there's a choice um, in marriage, we make a choice, especially in our culture. Um, it is a betrothal. Is it is it's a word for engagement that takes place. That's the word that we would use today. We go back to Genesis 24. We see this Abraham uh, choosing a son uh, is choosing a wife for his son Isaac. He says to his servant, "Swear by by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, you'll not take a wife for my son from where I live now. The Canaanites, they're evil, they're wicked." But go to my country, to my kindred, take a wife for my son, Isaac. And so the servant would go and choose a wife for Isaac that he would not meet until the wedding moment, wedding day. And so we see that arrangement here taking place. We see in the scriptures, the church itself, Paul says about those who were coming to Christ under his ministry, I feel a divine jealousy for you, but I'm passionate about you because I betrothed you to one husband. To Christ, as you were saved, the moment they were saved, they stepped into a, a a marriage relationship. When we are saved, we step in, we step into a a marriage relationship with Jesus Christ. We step into a relationship that's eternal. Um, the scriptures show us this picture so clearly. Ephesians chapter one verse four: He chose us. He betrothed us to Himself. He chose us. He went out and He chose us before the foundations of the world. As, as Abraham sent his servant to choose a wife for Isaac, God chose us from eternity past. Those are things that are hard to comprehend, and yet we see the reality of that from the Word of God. Um, when marriage took place, there was always a, a price that was required. When we think of a dowry, uh, we, think of, we think of the woman paying. In the Old Testament, it was often the man who would pay, the family of the wife, uh, to marry the daughter. A price was expected to help uh, with the expenses, to cover the expenses of the loss of the daughter and the value that she had in her family as that daughter now came into a new family. The bridegroom would pay that price. We pick it back up in Genesis 24. The servant uh, leaves. He takes 10 of his master's cam Abraham's camels filled with uh, choice gifts, uh, silver, gold, all kind of clothing, garments, costly ornaments. Um, ten, ten camels just filled with the best of what Abraham has. And to give to the family, this is wealth. Uh, Abraham was very wealthy, and he's, he gives the best of his wealth. To send with this, this servant to give to Rebekah's family, uh, to pay their family for the privilege of marrying their daughter. Um, now, sometimes uh, a, a groom would get married and, and simply wouldn't have the money for that kind of investment, that kind of payment. Well, we know what happens. Later on in Genesis 29, we encounter Jacob. Uh, he's going to marry. He goes to Laban, Jacob's father, and uh, he says, what's the cost? I don't have any money. He says, you serve seven years and I'll give you my daughter, Rachel. Well, he deceived him, gave he gave Jacob his daughter Leah instead, and he had to work another seven, 14 years as the dowry price, as the price for Rachel. It's a long story there, but just goes to show that there was always a, a, an investment that was required of the groom to the family of the bride to, to unite together as husband and wife. Of course, that's beautifully fulfilled perfectly by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He paid that price. He says to us, the church, you were ransomed, you were bought. A debt was paid, a price was paid, not with silver, not with gold, not with ornaments, not with those things, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's much more valuable than anything that he created himself or is on this earth. He extended grace in Christ. We have redemption through his blood. 
the forgiveness of her sins according to the riches of his grace. He extended grace. He paid the price. He extended grace. He gave to us the ability to be free, uh, to be united with him by his grace. And so we see marriage here being a significant, significant gift from God to humanity. Adam and Eve, he gave the ordinance of marriage. Today, when marriage takes place for the believer, it's still to be a, a picture of the unity between a husband and a wife, the two becoming one, representing the unity of the Godhead, the unity of God to his church that he will someday complete and fulfill. It is a, it is a picture of the grace of God. Marriage is a picture of, of the uh, of the holy righteousness of God, the commitment of a husband and wife together, which which signifies our commitment to Christ. So that that first step would be taking place. Uh, a, a wife would be chosen. Uh, a union would be gathered. A fa sometimes families would plan that even as the children were being born. They would share values as families. They would say, when our children are old enough, they're going to marry. Arrange marriages. There are still vast portions uh, around this world that still have arranged marriages. Um, I have friends that have been recipients of that as well. And so we see that uh, today still taking place in many ways. This, a second element then that would take place is that a home would be prepared. We see in John chapter 14, In my father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come again. I'm going to take you, the church, the bride, to come to be with me. A home is being prepared. Where? Where is it taking place? Uh, to the Father's house. To the Father's house. And so the groom the groom would leave. And the groom uh, would, um, would go to his home. Culturally, biblically, in the Old Testament, what would happen, and even we see this in the New Testament, uh, the families would just would just the house of the father's home would just grow as 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 the son was married they would add a new a new apartment a new a new dwelling place a new addition to the home and that home would just grow as mar as marriages took place and the father and the uh, the groom would bring the the bride into the home of the father build the home and so this would usually be a t uh, usually a time frame of a year the groom would would take time to build the home. He was freed from constraints in the culture for that year to give attention to the building of that home, to preparing for his bride, and then, and then well, we're going to see what takes place. And so we have that reality. The groom's responsibility then before marriage takes place is to go home and to prepare a place for that bride. Uh, in Psalm 45, we see that. In many colored robes, she, this virgin, is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. She's going to the home of her king. Again, we see this. The focus here is the bride, is the groom. It's the groom, not the bride. The bridegroom, not the bride. The one who has the bride, John says, is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. John said this about Jesus Christ when he introduced him to his ministry here on earth. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He, the bridegroom, must increase increase but I must decrease John recognizes that the bride of Christ must decrease the church hasn't been officially brought together yet not until after the, the cross and Jesus resurrection but here is the reality it has always been about Jesus Christ today as we live as the bride of Christ our life is to be about Christ we'll see that so the groom the groom goes back to his home. He's preparing a home for, for us. Well, we see that in John 14. Jesus has gone home. He's preparing a place for us. Our obligation is to be ready. We see that here. We're to love him. 1 Peter 1, 8. Though we haven't seen him, I've never met Christ. I've never met him visually. Neither, ha neither have you. have never met him face to face. And yet I'm betrothed to him. I'm engaged to him. I've made a commitment to him. When I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, when you did that too, you made a commitment to Christ. For him not only to be your savior, when we were saved, we asked him to be our savior, not to be our, our, uh, to be married to him. We don't, we didn't have that understanding. But that's exactly what took place. When we're saved, we're not saying, "Well, I'm going to get married to Jesus." When we're saying, when we're saved, we're saying, "I need a savior. I'm a sinner. I need him to do the work in my life. I can't do." But we understand that when we make that choice of salvation, we've entered into a, a beautiful relationship, where we will one day be. 
we understand that we are the bride of Christ. We are committed to Him. We're to love Him. We're to love Jesus Christ always until He comes. He is preparing a place for us. We're to love Him even though we are in His absence. He's not here physically with us. One day He will. That's, that calls us. It tests our commitment to Jesus Christ. We're to be ready. Matthew chapter 25, we have a parable of ten virgins. That they will go out to meet the bridegroom. He's delayed. They have to wait. They sleep here. Uh, but then there's a cry. The bridegroom's coming, and they come out to him. Well, the parable shows us that some are ready and some are not. We'll talk about that later. And the bride, the the uh, the bride is then brought home. The the groom finishes the housing and now comes to bring the bride home. You see that First Thessalonians chapter fourteen, chapter four. When the rapture occurs, Jesus Christ is going to come, come to the bride, come uh, to earth, not, not step on the earth. He's going to meet us in the air. He's going to call us to himself, and he's going to bring us to his Father's home, bring us to heaven. That's what he's going to do. That's what's going to take place. We're going to meet Jesus Christ. We're going to then always be with him. The bride is to be made ready. Here we see here in chapter 19, verse 7, verse 8, his bride has made herself ready, and it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen and bright and pure. That fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Here we see two important elements. This is really significant for us right now today. We see the character of the bride. The Lord Jesus Christ has called us to be sanctified, to be set apart to him, to make choices that, that represent that we are united to Jesus Christ, that we are the bride of Christ. He chose us, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. He chose us precisely that we would be holy and blameless before Him. He chose us so that we would walk in holiness on this earth, that we would be blameless before Him. This isn't about being perfect. We cannot be that. It's about aspiring to walk in a way that honors the Lord, to be that bride that honors the groom, to be that bride that, that exemplifies the character of Jesus Christ, to be pure, Second Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, my, as I present you to Jesus Christ, my desire is to present you as a pure virgin to Jesus Christ. How many times does that commitment get, get cast aside? How many, how many believers have simply left their commitment to Jesus Christ, have, have just uh, submitted themselves to idolatry, have submitted themselves to adultery, to fornication, to whatever that might be, just casually have sexual intimacy with with people outside of marriage um, then as simply believers to 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 just follow the passions of our emotions and our spirit and not to follow after Jesus Christ we're called to follow after Christ with a purity of heart Revelation chapter 3 the book that we're in right now speaks of those in Sardis the church of Sardis he says there are those who have not soiled their garments their garments have not been corrupted tainted by sinful lifestyles. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They have been overcomers. Soiled here doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean they're not doesn't mean they're perfect, but they've confessed their sin. Um, and they've yielded to God. They've yielded to God. They've yielded those weaknesses to God and it's become strength in their life. Their walk in Christ. They have become overcomers. Jesus Christ has been the victory. And he wants to be that for you as the bride of Christ. He has promised to give you everything you need to be victorious. He's promised you everything you need so that you can make choices that honor Him. He's promised you and I the ability to be holy in this earth. He's given us the opportunity and the ability to be a bride who will honor Him in how we live right now as we wait for the Lord to return. We have the opportunity to say yes to the Lord, to say yes to the Word of God, to say yes to obedience. We have the opportunity by the Spirit of God to say no to temptation, no to disobedience, no to sin in front of us. We have that power. Spirit of God using the Word of God. We're to become like Christ. Revelation 3.18 I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments. Buy gold and buy white garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Buy gold be willing to let God uh, purge you on this earth. Be willing to let God bring hardship into your life to teach you to be like Christ. 
Be willing to let Jesus Christ love you by walking with you through adversity. Be willing to let Jesus Christ love you by making right choices that honor him. When, we're, when we do that, we're saying this, I do have a groom in heaven. There is a wedding awaiting me in heaven. I want to be a part of the bride of Christ that honors him so that when I stand before him with the very best of my ability, by the Spirit of God, I have honored Jesus Christ and how I've lived. That's his intention for you and for me. None of us will do that perfectly and can do that perfectly. We simply cannot do that perfectly. We can aspire to that. We can have victory in that. We can, we can see patterns in our life changed. We can see the character of Christ stamped on our life. We can see progress the longer we live, but we will never be sinless until one day we're with Christ. And so the character of Christ has to then be imputed upon us, be given to us, because it's not of ourselves. He's going to make the bride what it needs to be to complete this picture. Ephesians chapter 5, when we're saved, Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. He might set her apart as an object of his love, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, having cleansed her with the word of God, the power of the word. We're cleansed and we let the word of God have its way in our life. So that he might what? Present us. That he might present the church to himself. How? In splendor. Without spot, taint, corruption, without wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. He's doing that work. We are to aspire to that. And God will give us the ability to live that way. But we cannot be sinless. He has to do this. He did this at the cross. When we're saved, we're saved on the basis of this work. He already did this in our life. We, we now stand before Jesus Christ clean. But I still make choices in my life that are unclean. Jesus Christ has to take care of that. He will take care of that. He calls me to walk in obedience. But he will ultimately do a final work in my life. He reminds me of 1 Corinthians. We're to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What I do is going to be revealed. It's going to be purified. It's going to be revealed by fire, and the fire is going to test everything that I'm going to do. It's going to be you know, all the stuff that makes me ugly as a bride of Christ is going to be burned away. It's going to be it's going to be cast away. And when that work is done, I will be a beautiful, completed work, a, com a bride that is the, the most beautiful bride you've ever seen. That will be presented to Jesus Christ. He will do the work that must be done that we cannot do in the end, but that we can aspire to and we can live for him and we can honor Christ now. You and I must choose to do that. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When, when he comes back and the, his home is for us is complete and he brings his home to his father's house, that first step will be we will receive incorruptible bodies immediately as we're resurrected to meet Jesus Christ. And then we will stand before him at the beam of seat of Christ. And he will burn off all the dross. And he will reward us for our faithfulness. He will reward us for, for walking with Jesus Christ. And he will make us pure and holy and present us as a bride beautiful before him. And the marriage will take place in heaven. And that's what will take place is that marriage. You have the marriage of the Lamb here in, in verse 7. It is the marriage of the Lamb. Here we see in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, man shall leave his mother and his wife. Shall be two uh, shall become one flesh. And, and when a marriage takes place, a man and a woman come together and become one flesh. And that, that, but there is significance more than that. That is a picture. That is a beauty. That is to be, that is to be the first moment of that kind of intimacy in a person's life. Here, Jesus tells us it is more significant just, than just that physical act and that physical moment. It is, it is a picture of Jesus Christ and his church being united together for all eternity. That's how important your marriage is. That's how important the picture of marriage is. And so the two come together. So Jesus brings us home, and he's prepared a place for us, and, and he's purified us, and he's cleaned us and cleansed us, and, and, he's, and he's clothed us with his righteousness. And the bride is transformed from one who is spotted and corrupted uh, by sin, unconfessed sins, and he, he, he 
completes the work that he promised at the cross and he makes us holy and now we are per, we are holy before him we are a bride that is beyond description in beauty and we are united to Jesus Christ and and the beauty then of this picture is is the marriage feast that's what this is all about the bible just doesn't tell us much about it i want to know more the marriage feast it's it's one of joy folks this is just this is just joy is what this is all about an inter interesting Psalm chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. And day to day pours out His speech. And night to night the knowledge of God. And that's just a beautiful description of how God is always pouring out uh, the, the evidence of who He is on this earth. And, the, and so that we as, as, as humanity are able to see who God is by His power, His creation, His glory. We are all held accountable to that. He says that voice goes out. That, go, that voice goes out. Here's what he says. This is in the same passage. It comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. You know, when the, when the, when the groom brings his wife home, there is a ceremony, and then there is a, there is a consummation of that marriage. And they go into the father's tent, and there is physical intimacy together. And there is a uniting together, two becoming one, for the first time between a man and a wife. And when that's done, the, here's the picture. The bridegroom comes, comes out of that chamber, folks, and it's like, woo-hoo, right? I mean, that's what we got to say, right? And, uh, and he comes out with joy. And, and the picture here of God's will, God's revealed will, and God's glory is this. His will, his glory is something that brings joy in our life. Here's the picture. It's being compared to this beautiful picture, and it brings, it brings absolute satisfaction. That's what glory and eternity will, will do. And it is the promise of a future we can't even comprehend. It is the promise of blessing and abundance. And when the, bride, and when the bridegroom comes out of that chamber, he's looking at a future that is just filled with wonder. He's, he's looking at the fulfillment of a moment that's taking place that is, that is beyond description. And, and the will of God and the glory of God are wrapped up in that reality. And folks, I want you to know the relationship you have with Christ is to be all that and more. That is the abundant life we have in Jesus Christ. Weddings, we have to remember, are the, are the cult, were the cultural highlight of the day. When there was a wedding, it superseded everything except, except Passover and the feasts that were together. It was the cultural highlight. You know, there's a wedding here in Cana uh, in the time of Jesus. His mother is there. Jesus is there. The disciples are there. Many people are there. They run out of wine. We can't run out of wine because the whole picture here is joy. The whole picture here is celebration. The family is is paying for all of this this celebration this marriage feast it would last from a day to a week could even be longer if it's a king and 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 the bridegroom is praying paying for all of these guests housing them and feeding them and folks it's an expense that's is but it's joy it's joy it is joy and that's what i want us to catch here it is exclusive in every way it is an exclusive invitation look here in, in verse 9 the angel said to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These words are true. They're the true words of God. Not everyone's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here we have, here we have the marriage, the marriage of the Lamb, verse 7, has come. The marriage has taken place in heaven. The unity between Christ and the church has taken place. During the tribulation, there's been something also very glorious happening in heaven. Something that we're not given a glimpse into. We're not given a glimpse into the app, into the scene and the how-tos and all that. But the beam of seat of Christ has taken place. The judgment seat of Christ has been taken place. The bride has been made beautiful and pure. And now that that union has taken place between Christ and the church, and, and forever we are we are united with Jesus Christ. And now we have here this this marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It has it has come. The bride has made herself ready. When she, before she was raptured, she wasn't ready. Many believers were because they were living in anticipation, living in obedience, but they still weren't perfect. They still weren't sinless. We raptured up, receiving our incorruptible bodies, made holy before Christ at the beam of seat of Christ, and, and then presented to Jesus Christ as a bride and to all those who are there in heaven. And now we have a marriage feast. We believe that marriage feast most likely is going to take place throughout the millennial kingdom. We see, a, we see a, uh, I think, a, 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 an important element that shows us that 
maybe even into into eternity. We just have a we have a beautiful uh, picture here that's taking place. Um, again, chapter twenty five, verse one of Matthew: the Kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. The feast, a time of celebration. Some in this parable would not be there, and some would. Here we have those who are invited. Who's going to be invited? Some won't be there. Some, many will not be there. Some will be there. Here's who we believe will be here. We believe, I believe, this will take place during, because it says it has come. Jesus Christ's second coming is to take place. And then we go into the millennial kingdom. And it seems clear that this feast is going to spread into the millennial kingdom and be a part of that millennial kingdom experience. And um, I believe Old Testament saints will be there. We believe the Old Testament saints are resurrected here at this time, at the end, when Jesus Christ returns. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those, this is speaking of Old Testament believers, Old Testament people, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Not every Jew is going to be united with Christ. Not every Jew goes to heaven. Only those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus made that very clear. The scriptures make that very clear. In Israel, we see this. Israel itself is a people chosen of God, holy to God, a special chosen treasured possession out of all the peoples of the earth. Even, even the imagery of, of unity is there. God says to Israel, your maker is your husband. He even showed that, that connection of, of love to Israel in that, in that beautiful sense. Now, the the bride of Christ here specifically is the church here in Revelation. The church is absent in chapters um, 4 through 18. This is when all this is taking place. The marriage is taking place. Israel is, is, is on the earth. The church is in heaven. Uh, but here we see that Israel also has a special relationship. Hosea chapter 2, I will betroth you to me, that's Israel, forever. You know, Hosea is, is a picture of how Israel walked away from, from God in unfaithfulness and adultery. And um, for a time, God separated from them, and yet He shows us here His absolute love for them, that He would love them to the very end, be committed to them to the very end. Israel is never thrown by the wasteland, wayside and forgotten. She is precious to the Lord even now. We have a feast here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. I believe this is part of this marriage supper of the Lamb. I will, I will tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the kingdom of heaven. This may be separate. It may be a part of this picture. There's a feast element that's going on. I believe Gentiles and Jews will be together. I believe the church is going to be the focus here, the bride of Jesus Christ. And then you have those who are invited to the table, Old Testament believers. You have tribulation martyrs. We've already seen those in Revelation 6, those who are being saved during the tribulation. They are now in heaven. They're given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Uh, they'll be resurrected at the end. Of their, their spirits are with Jesus Christ. They'll be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. Um, Revelation 7, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white. Then you have those... Uh, during the tribulation, who survive, who are not executed, slaughtered for the sake of Christ, they will go into the millennial kingdom, and then they will have children who will have to make choices about where they stand with Jesus Christ. Those invited to this feast will be those who are believers, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, uh, in God alone. Whether it's Old Testament saints, New Tribulation saint, tribulation saints, or maybe even those being saved during the millennium. The Bible is silent on a lot of that. And yet it clearly says others will be invited. We know those invited can only be those who are saved. And we know that the Old Testament saints will be resurrected to life, that the tribulation saints will be resurrected to life, and uh, those who are being saved during the tribulation will also have privileges and opportunities. Then we come to Revelation 21. This is kind of where we close. Then came one of the seven bowl, seven angels who had one of the seven bowls, the, the seven bowl judgments, full of the seven last plagues. And he spoke to me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And we see, looking back at verse 2 of the same chapter, 
John says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the ultimate home prepared for us. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. That's what we see there in Revelation chapter 21. Here we have the bride of Christ, clearly in chapter 19. The church is the bride of Christ. We have those invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is joyous. It is it is satisfaction in every way. It is, the, it is the fulfillment of promise. It is the promise of abundant blessing. It is all those things. It is it is the feasting with the Savior. It is the enjoyment of believers together. It is all those things. And then here you have here in Revelation 21, you have the city, the new Jerusalem coming down, adorned, it says, uh, as a bride. Um, in the millennial kingdom, you're still going to have you're still going to have the church. You're going to have Old Testament believers. You're going to have those who were martyred for Jesus Christ, those who are being saved in the tribulation. They're going to be uh, working together seamlessly, but yet separate groups. Uh, all of God's promises in the Old Testament to Israel will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. But then when we come, when the great white throne judgment occurs and sin and sinners are finally thrown into the lake of fire, it seems that those distinctions between all of those groups are going to be uh, erased as God's people are brought together in one in one people. All of God's promises have then been fulfilled to to, Jeru to Israel, to the believers of the Old Testament, uh, to those who have been saved in the church, to those who have been saved, and now we are united together in His eternal promises for all time. We're united together as it were one bride. And uh, that Old Testament imagery of Israel being... Uh, God being a husband to Israel is fulfilled, I believe, here in, in Revelation 21. Ultimately, we are united together, and ultimately, we are an expanded bride of Christ. We are all now then one body, one, one person, uh, united with Christ. It is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Folks, it is, it is exciting. It is necessary that you know Jesus Christ as Savior. It is necessary that you walk with Christ now. You see, the affirmation of your faith in Christ, the affirmation of your salvation, is not just the profession of faith that you made. That seals the deal. But the way you live your life affirms whether that decision you made was genuine and true. If I choose to live my life apart from Christ, if I choose to live my life running from His will in disobedience, that will show me that the choice that I made to proclaim Christ was not a genuine one. If I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and confess my sins and He becomes the Lord of my life and the groom of my life, and then I choose to live for Him and to wait for His coming and to live in anticipation of His coming and to honor Him with how I live my life and to say, Lord, I'm going to be a bride who will honor You, who will not be a dishonor to You. I'm not going to commit adultery with this world. I'm not going to commit idolatry with this world. I'm not going to live for and in this world and forget you you are going to be the priority of my life the focal point of my life if that's if that's how your life is described then it reveals to you ultimately in harmony with first john and, and scriptures that you have a genuine walk and a faith in jesus christ i trust you do then you and i have something glorious to look forward to May God just give you the joy of this moment. I want you to, to live today by remembering the joys that await you tomorrow. God wants the book of Revelation to touch your life now so that you will live for Christ and reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ and be holy before Him because, because the joys of His promises so fill your heart that day after day, you and I say, it's worth it, no matter what He asks me to do. It's worth it to be holy to God. It is worth it to obey God. It is worth it to go through adversity. It is worth it to be purged by the fire of His holiness. It is worth it. Because one day, the joys of unity with Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, a new heaven and earth, the joy of the very presence of Christ for all eternity will render anything that is a challenge in my life now, it will, it will have been worth it all. May that be your passion, your desire, your understanding, your perspective today. And walk today 
like it matters. May the Lord touch your heart so that you and I will be committed to that. That's my prayer. Thank you for visiting with us today. Be considerate of your life in view of this promise. Walk to please the bridegroom. We'll see you again next week. Continue to walk with us and to grow. Goodbye.